Okay. As we've said before, you know, we're, we're taking in a deep dive into the Sermon on the Mount, or, or as deep as our uh, intellect will let us go, um, into the, the Beatitudes right now, and then further into the Sermon on the Mount. And this is uh, such a revolutionary piece of work. And we, we need to read it that way. It was revolutionary in the eyes of uh, big religion of those days. It was revolutionary in the eyes of, of uh, their nationality. It was revolutionary in the eyes of how it confronted the empire at that point. And the Beatitudes were the opening statement to this entire sermon. The Beatitudes are that, that first suggestion, that first hint that things aren't exactly as they may seem. And the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about isn't like the kingdoms we're used to experiencing. In this kingdom, the blessed ones are at the bottom of society, not at the top of society. The Hebrew religion, certainly the Caesars and, and Roman uh, rule and Roman law would suggest that no, it, it's the high up, it's the elite that are the most blessed in our society. But Jesus says, no, that's not so in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom, the blessings favored certain segments of society and people groups, uh, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the non-glamorous are the blessed. And then here at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus brings some really hard truth. When you make your home in the new kingdom, it's not all giggles. You've got to be ready to endure some persecution. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then, then it gets more personal. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Why? Because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, you're going to get it too. This is hard truth for an American Christian. Do we understand it? Do we listen to it? Do we take it in? Do we contemplate it? Do we let it shape and form who we are and what we do and how we live, move, and have our being in the world? Several years ago, our friend Matt told us a story that's proven to be just absolutely unforgettable. Unforgettable. Steve and Marcy know Matt. We know Matt. Several of us do. Matt's first pastoral assignment was just down the road in Fruitland. He was a young pastor, and that was his first assignment. So he went to Fruitland, and he spent some fruitful years there. Then he and his family moved to the Philippines, where they did some missionary work for about 10 years. They come back, Matt and his family, and they plant a church up in Meade, Washington, just outside Spokane. And the church flourished. Then all of a sudden, uh, Matt became a district superintendent over the Columbia River Conference at that time. And then after serving in that role for a while, he became one of the three bishops of the Free Methodist Church in the United States, the, the governing body for our denomination. And the story that Matt told was so moving and so impressive that I knew it was a story that I needed to hear again in preparation for this kind of a Sunday. So as I prepared this week, I emailed Matt and I said, Matt, it's Jim out in southwest Idaho. Would you be kind enough to recount this story for me? And he did, and we'll get to that in a, in a couple of minutes. But again, I want to acknowledge that the subject of persecution is hard for us to wrap our minds around. It absolutely is. Why? Because we're Americans. We have never not been the top dog. Never. Never in our experience have we not been 
loud, proud, and in charge. It makes this subject of persecution hard for us to, to comprehend and understand and, and deal with. And Christians in the United States really live with no real persecution compared to Christians in other parts of the world. And on the screen behind me, you're going to see some data. It's the 50 top, if you want to call it top, countries in the world where Christians this morning live with the greatest threat of persecution. Why? Because just like you and me, they follow Jesus. That's the reason. Able to live our lives and practice our faith quite comfortably by comparison. I mean, we don't face persecution on that kind of level. What we do face these days is a threat to a lot of the things that we hold dear. What we face these days might make us feel uneasy, right? But it's not persecution. Even as we, we watch the culture and, and, and see things eroding, and, and all these things, these virtues and values that we have held dear as Christians, and we know that our nation was founded on, as we see culture begin to erode those things, well, it hurts, but it doesn't make it persecution. That's politics. And as we go right back to the Sermon on the Mount, this is a political statement. He's contesting the way of the world. We don't, we don't live in persecution. We live under the heavy hand of politics. And in our highly politicized age, the, the fact that culture, the culture has taken, taken on the role of being the biggest mockers of Christianity. The culture has begun to, to mock us for taking biblical perspectives on life, on the beginning of life, on sex, on gender, on equality, on creation, on justice, on the poor, on the homeless, because we take a Christian perspective of these things, these key social issues, we become ridiculed and, and mocked. But still, mockery and persecution by the pop culture isn't persecution. It's politics. And yeah, it hurts our feelings, but it's not persecution. You know, we live in this area, and, and all I could think of this week was how many times, just in our local context, let's, let's say Canyon County context, when somebody runs for an elected position, one of the first things that they will march out is, I'm a good Christian. Yet everything that they say after that sounds like a political slogan. Some Christians want to claim that they're persecuted because we live in this era where if you're a victim, you somehow have some social cachet. You have something going on for you. And these same people will refuse to concede that maybe it's some of their stupid... <clears throat> okay, thank you. S sometimes it's the stupid things they say when they're running for office, that brings the ridicule. They, they place the target on their own backs. Sometimes you'll see people that say, uh, I'm a Christian, believing that the Christian entitles them to some broad cultural and civic acceptance. Because I say I'm a Christian, you have to take me and what I say is good news. You have to take me, my ideas, and my politics seriously. The author Sky Jatani said in a book I read just recently, he said, frankly, some Christians suffer because they're unsufferable. And we're still not persecuted. Persecution is a toxin. It's an evil that's produced whenever two irreconcilable ideas collide. You have two value systems at opposite ends of the spectrum that collide. And we know that this comes either from, well, it can be birthed in a racial 
or a political or a global or, sadly, even a religious context. Wherever two powers collide, the stronger generally persecutes the weaker. Now, we're going to show a, a picture here, but please do not answer out loud. I will mark you down, and your final grade will be less if you say anything here. Zach, put that up. What do you see? Is this a checkerboard or a chessboard? Jesus lived, spoke, taught, led in an era where these people that he's called blessed, the poor in spirit, the meek, the mourning, the peacemakers, they lived under the control of big religion, a military-industrial complex, and an emperor who thought he was a god. And into this world, Jesus challenges everything. How does he challenge everything? By changing the game. It's the same game board, but it's played with different pieces for different reasons, to different ends, by different means, with different values, different concepts and in the service of two different kingdoms. The game has changed. Into one game, onto one game board that we call our earth, our world, comes a new game. So when Jesus says, it's the meek who are blessed, not the mighty and powerful who will inherit the earth, the world is asking, well, what game are you playing? This isn't our game. And when Jesus said, you've been taught to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who torment you and persecute you. In doing so, you become children of your Father in heaven. He, after all, loves each of us, good and evil, kind and cruel. And the world responds, that's a dumb game. And of course, yeah, sure, sounds good. We will persecute you. And as Jesus closes the Beatitudes, here at the end, he, he said, there are certain catalysts that lead to persecution of his followers. And if we are his followers, these are the catalysts that will earn us persecution. It's because we've made the pursuit of righteousness our goal and because we are seen to be his followers because of him. And in some countries today, when you are known by your holy life and look and live like the rabbi looks and lives, these become the very things that will get you killed. Do you know how fortunate you are to live in America? And in that sense, the Christian faith in our nation has enjoyed a privileged, privileged place for a very long time. I mean, even, even the people that you know who refuse to embrace Jesus still love the Judeo-Christian ethic. Love your neighbor, be honest and trustworthy. Those ethics that are just cooked into the system. These were the bedrock. They, they were the foundation that our entire governance was ordered on and built on. I mean, in the, in the past, when we would say, in God we trust, that was never an idea to be challenged, right? It was a core belief that we le leaned into it and we clung to that when we were at war. And more recently, with the Oklahoma City uh, bombing and 9-11, Churches were full because at our core, on the bedrock on which we stand, in God we trust. Churches were full the evening of 9-11. And you and I live as Christians with comforts that many don't have. 
And it's true. I mean, we're living in a time and and age when the virtues and values that we've lived by as a society are facing this constant erosion, whether it's by talking heads or opinion makers or influencers. We feel it. Yeah, those virtues and values are under attack, but Christians are not. We go on living. You know, and sometimes we, we take this idea that the loss of a accepted privilege is punitive. Like when, when some cities will remove the Ten Commandments from a city park or they take prayer out of public school or those things, those things hurt us as believers. It might feel like persecution in light of how things used to be but it's not persecution, it's politics. And I think many times we're just simply nostalgic for how it used to be, how it used to actually mean something to be called a Christian. You weren't somebody's punching bag. We're nostalgic over the loss of the good standing, excuse me, the loss of the good standing that we once enjoyed and and, and acceptance of our faith in the public arena. But we're not losing our faith. If anything, we've got to cling to it even more diligently, carefully, persistently. As King David wrote, you know, we may be the sheep of his pasture, but you know something? We still want to be seen as the cool kids. I know that's a stretch, but I found the picture and I thought, well, we'll make it work. See, it's not that we're persecuted. It's just we're not used to being mocked every time we turn around and made fun of because of these things that we hold so crucial to who we are. And the first generation believers who themselves were no strangers to persecution I'm not there yet, but somehow, some way, they saw following Jesus as being greater than any insult, any inconvenience, any cost, any torture, any legal prohibition, to the point that any manner of death that the empire could throw at them, oh, it's only a scratch. And within just a few decades, a notorious persecutor of Christians, wrote this to followers living in Rome and living and dying under Nero's persecution. This is what he says. Now, after everything I've been through, the good, the bad, in light of my present and in light of my past, I'm sure of this. I'm sure of this. The sufferings we endure now are not even worth comparing to the glory that is coming and will be revealed in us. Load up the arsenal, fire it at me. We have victory in Jesus. And to the Christians in Philippi, this same guy who used to persecute Christians as a hobby and a vocation, he writes to Christians in in Philippi, this, this Roman military retirement community, Paul is so sold out, so looking at life beyond what he could see, he wrote this, I want to know him. I want to know Jesus inside and out. I want to experience the power of his resurrection and join in his suffering, shaped by his death, so that I may arrive safely at the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, bring it on. Living like Jesus will make you a target for anyone, anything, any power that sees Jesus as a threat. And there are a lot of those out there. If they see you as a member of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the world knows your name, has your number. Later, Jesus explained to his small group 
in the privacy of an upper room. He said, if you find that the world despises you, remember that before it despised you, it first despised me. If you were a product of the world order, if you were playing the game that the world wants you to play, then, they, then it would love you. But you are not a product of the world because I have taken you out of it. And it despises you for that very reason. Don't forget what I've spoken to you. A servant is not greater than the master. If I was mistreated, you should expect nothing less. Not even if you are an American. There are believers, people just like us around the world right now who are despised because of their affiliation with Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Yet they don't find the persecution to be punitive. They see it to be a privilege. Now, here's what our friend Matt had to say. I'm not going to mention the name of the, the country that he's referring to, but I think we all know. They proclaim that their deepest allegiance is not to the party, to the state, the nation, not even to a religion, but the person, the man, the savior, Jesus. And his kingdom. And the privilege that they have knowing that they are at work to help the kingdom come. Yeah, you can threaten them with death. They'll keep saying the same things, doing the same things, working the same way. Jesus said, Blessed are those who take it on the chin because of righteousness. For their feet are planted in the kingdom of heaven. They have a deep and abiding relationship with God because they are his sons and daughters. They are a force. Even then, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Why? Because of me. I hope I haven't been too harsh. But guys, we've got it good compared to the rest of the world. We do. I'm sure that there have been times when you have recognize that in quiet times and moments and yeah it is a a blessing to live in a country that allow, allows us to live and work and have our being in the manner that we do we appreciate that and we can feel nostalgic from time to time but we are not under any kind of persecution. Sure, politics are at play, but uh, we aren't persecuted. And as we come to the table this morning, you know guys, these are the same elements that our brothers and sisters in Laos, in Myanmar, in North Korea, it's the same body and the same blood. These are our brothers and sisters. So as you come this morning, I hope <laughs> they are heavy on your heart. And as you pray and thank God for the blessing, for Christ's sacrifice of his body and the shedding of his blood, so we could become brothers and sisters in a new kingdom, a new way of life. Would you remember them as you pray?